Welcome in, welcome in. We are getting right back to Revelation. Welcome in, everyone. We will get started in like one minute. We are back on Revelation. We are at for a while. Um, while we're waiting for a few more people to join, we are. <laughs> thank you, Trinity. <laughs> we are on Revelation three and seven. That's where we're starting at. Welcome in, everyone. I, I pray everyone is having a blessed Sunday. Um, it is what is five oh two my time. Where where are you guys? What city or state are you guys located in? I never know where people are are you know joining me from. What city or state are you in? I am in Cali, in the high desert of California. Oh, in North Carolina, nice. Welcome from uh, Missouri. Nice. Welcome in from Missouri. I am so happy. Uh, hi, Bella. Thank you. Uh, the mountains were so peaceful. It wasn't even a treacherous drive. LA. Okay. I'm from LA. Um, it wasn't even a treacherous drive. I'm not one from winding all in the mountains. Hey, April from Missouri. I'm not one drive uh, to be all in the mountains, but it was really nice. And you guys, I am not joking. We, me and my daughter were going to walk to, um, cause we stayed at a resort. So my husband can go race his car and we were going to go walk to the activity center. I kid y'all not. It was like a, a gang of eight turkeys. I kid you not. Eight Turkeys are huge. What wind up on the table? Uh, Y'all, them turkeys was like four feet, maybe three feet, and they were not scared. So I didn't, I didn't approach. I, I heard them gobble gobbling, like all that noise. They loud too. I heard them running their mouth, and I saw the little kids, and I said, "Okay, right." I would have passed out. I would have passed out straight up. I saw the little kids. I said, "We the kids, they doing what they do. I'm going to just test the waters and see what the kids do. And then I seen the turkey chasing the little kids. I said, that's my cue. We're not going. Uh, we're not going that way. Thankfully, it was the opposite direction. And I asked the uh, the like the like front desk of the resort, um, are those turkeys uh, aggressive? She said, turkeys are not usually aggressive, but I would stay back. Ma'am, you should have led with stay back. That's it. That's all I would have, you know, you should have let it stay back, but it's all good. So, yes, um, but it was really beautiful being in the mountains. You're away from everything. It was the air is really clean um, and it's just no uh, Galatians is on Friday. But T, honestly, I did a um, I did an introduction to Galatians. So you haven't missed anything. It was just an introduction. So. Um, Coming up this Friday, don't worry, we are in chapter one. I wanted to do an introduction because I was in the mountains and I just, I didn't have everything. And so it just felt, I didn't feel like I was ready. I had my notes, I had everything, but I just didn't have um, everything that I wanted. Hi, Ashlyn. So Bible, Bible studies are 5 p.m. on Fridays and 5 p.m. on Sundays, um, Pacific Standard Time. So it's 5.06 my time. So whatever, however that equates for you, but it's Pacific Standard Time um, and it's Fridays and Sundays. So on Sundays, we are in Revelation right now, unless God gives us something to just really break down. Like we did a few weeks of the spirit of pride and everything I post on my uh, YouTube, which is linked in my bio. I also. Um, I also. Um, do Gal we just started Galatians Friday that just passed, but I just did an introduction to Galatians, so you didn't miss anything. And I am going to post that on my YouTube also. It's just an introduction of what Galatians is about. But we are right now at Revelation 
chapter three, we are starting at verse seven. So if you miss chapters one, two, and chapter three up um, one through six, it is already on my YouTube. You can take your time and listen to it, but we really break down the word here. Um, we look up the, the key words, the scripture, so we can know in context of exactly what was being said. Um, so without further ado, am I saying that correctly? Without further ado, Revelation chapter three, verse seven. But before we start, Lord, please forgive me. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to feast on your word. Lord, I ask that you um, open our hearts and our minds to receive from you, God. I pray, God, that we take what we learn out of this, out of the Bible and out of your word and apply it to our everyday life so that we are an example and we are winning souls to Christ with the testimony of who you are, Jesus, through your word. And any monitoring spirits, anybody trying to come up against the word of God and the power of God, we bind in the name of Jesus. Any spirits trying to cause any doubt and fear, we bind in the name of Jesus. Revelation is not a scary book. It's a book full of instruction for God's children so that we know how to manage and navigate in these last and evil days. So we thank you right now, God, for this book of instruction and this book of protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Believe it or not, Revelation, it also is a book full of protection. It God tells us, God tells us, hey, Soren Eagle, God tells us that, um, when most of the judge, when the judgments and the plagues and all of these things are released, he he covers us and tell us um, that we are covered. He even commands those who are released to do the judgments not to touch those with the seal. And we know the Holy Spirit seals us. So, y'all, Revelation is nothing to be fearful of. When you are in Christ, we can embrace. This end time, because we know that this is is the precursor before we go with our father. Oh, yes, we get to go with our father. Hallelujah. So here we go. Revelation chapter three, verse seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith: he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of D David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth, and no man openeth. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I wanted to break down the key of David. Um, and so verse seven is saying, Jesus says to Philadelphia, I am the one who has the key of David. He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man opens. So Jesus is letting the church of Philadelphia know, I have the key. I have the key that no man can open or shut. Um, and so now let's just look up what the key of David is. And remember, I do all my studies using the Bible dictionary, the Bible concordance. Um, I use scripture references to understand the word more. That is how I study the word. Um, and so the key of David is power and authority. So Jesus is saying, I am the one who holds power and authority. That's what the key of David is. Uh, Christ is the possessor of power and authority, the right and power of opening the gate and admitting those who had the right of entrance. He could open and no man could shut. This was grace. He could shut and no man can open. This was sovereignty. This combo of grace and sovereignty is what Philadelphia needed because of all they experienced and, and uh, needed as they stood for righteousness and had minimal resources. So brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to tell you this. In these last and evil days, we know that Church of Philadelphia, um, we broke down each church. Um, 
but they were ones who were walking upright before God. So the church of Philadelphia, they were rich in spirit, but they did not have a lot of monetary resources. So they did suffer a lot. There were massive earthquakes that affected the church and they didn't have the resources to rebuild. So they were suffering a lot. But what, what Jesus is reminding them is that he has the power and the authority. He has grace and sovereignty. So his grace covers and his sovereignty. Have you ever heard someone say, that's not fair? This person had the exact same thing, the exact same diagnosis, and they survived. And my family member didn't. That's God's sovereignty. Sometimes we don't understand why he allows certain things, why we go through certain things, but with his grace, his covering and his sovereignty, meaning no one can stop him. No one can um, can do anything that he's not allowing. No one can come in and pluck us out and no one can destroy us. That's his sovereignty. So we don't understand it all the time. But our faith and our confidence is in Christ. And when we know he has the power, he has the key. Nobody can take that from him. There is comfort in that. Amen. I am comforted in knowing that we serve a God who has all power and authority in his hands. The enemy has some power. The enemy has some authority. As we get deeper into Revelation, when they release, when when the seals are released, when uh when when let me see, because I've already gotten this far, but we're gonna get here. When the bottomless pit is open and the locusts are released, Jesus gave the enemy power and authority to unalive one third of mankind but he also in his sovereignty said don't touch mine those who are covered i forgot to turn this one on those who are covered god told the enemy you can only unalive one third so first the locusts came first when they came they just were for five years they were just thinking i mean five months singing and singing and singing or six months Stinging and stinging where they wish they was no longer alive. But they still only had authority and power to do that to one third of mankind. Who has the authority to tell the lowercase God of this world, you only can do so much. So it is imperative that we are on the right side of power. Uh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We want to be on the right side of power. I don't know about y'all, but I want to be on the side who has the key of David, which is all power and all authority that even demons have to submit to the power and authority of Christ. You know, the great thing about that. The Bible says greater is he that is in us. So this is talking about Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus in us gives us his power and his authority, meaning we have the power of Christ, the authority of Christ to trample over demons and serpents. We have the power and the authority of Christ to command demons to flee. We have the power and the authority to, to command sickness to go in the name of Jesus. Uh, the reason I, uh, I don't play any music with words is because I post it on my YouTube. So I only play Jappy T keys. Um, I don't know what Sea of Thieves is, Thieves is, but that's the only reason I don't play any music with words because, uh, uh, what you call it? They be playing YouTube and I like to post it on YouTube so people can watch it later. Um, so. So once again, this combo of grace and sovereignty is what Philadelphia needed because of all they experienced and needed. Uh, and they needed as they stood for righteousness and had minimal resources. So those of you who are going through 
Those of you who feel like you don't have enough, it's never enough. Life is hard. Things are difficult. God's grace and his sovereignty is letting you know. He's reminding you, I have all power. I have all authority. And in me, you have that same power and authority. Do not be dismayed. Continue to trust in me. Continue to walk in my power and in my authority. Continue to run the race to the end. So for God to tell them that, us as believers must know that sometimes we will experience hardships. Sometimes we will experience um, difficulties. Sometimes situations will come up in our life that are so challenging, so overwhelming, that makes us want to give up. But we have to align ourselves with the one who has the key of David. And what is the key of David? Power and authority. Hallelujah. So then let's break down what sovereignty is. God's absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. And of man is dominion of. So sovereignty is what it says, what if we put it in layman's terms, meaning just regular schmegler talk, God can do what he want to do because he can. He can do what he want to do when he want to do it. He don't have to ask our permission. The good thing is, just like with Jeremiah, when Jeremiah prophesied that the children of Israel would be taken captive. And he told them, you need to be taken captive. If you're not taken captive, you will be destroyed in the end of life. He said, but be taken captive. I know you don't want to be under the Babylonians for 70 years, but I need to trust you. And then this is where that scripture comes in. I know the plans I have for you. They are to prosper you. They are for your good, not evil. That is what that scripture is attached to. When Jeremiah said, I mean, when the Lord said that, he was saying, even though I'm telling you to go in captivity, my plans for you are good, not evil. So that scripture just not for anything. When people walking around quoting that, make sure you ask them, oh, wow, God told you to go into something real dangerous. Because that's why God said that. So he's saying, and he was encouraging them, do what I say do, even if it doesn't look right, sound right, feel right, do it. My sovereignty gives me the right as God. Amen. My, so my sovereignty as, um, as God, uh, Mr. Gone, I like your name because you're about to be gone. I like when people don't... Um, don't really know the word and then they say something like that. I love when people do that and you don't even understand. Um, so he's gone. So um, God's sovereignty means he has the absolute right, the absolute right to do as he pleases. And we know that everything that God does and allows is for our good according to his righteousness. According to his will for our life. Amen. Grace is favor. Kindness shown by God to guilty man. Um, God bless you. It stands in contrast to law, also to works and to um, and to uh, or reward. Grace refers to refers more to the source and character of the sentiment, mercy to the state of the person who is its object. So grace says, that even though we deserve the punishment of the law, God is so good, so kind, so loving. He gave us Jesus. So in this, remember, 
Jesus is telling John to give all these letters to the churches. So in this, remember last time John saw Jesus, he was the lamb that was slain that rose. So the last time Jesus didn't come like this, ready to fight, box them up. He did a little more teaching, but he actually, he was still that, you know, I leave with you the comforter. But this time John is seeing Jesus and in his sovereignty, he's saying, I see all the good they did. I'm not coming on that tip right now. I need you to send these letters to the seven churches. And let them know I mean business. Because I'm God, I can do what I want. I can say what I want. But it all, it all is for your good. I'm telling you these things in this letter, these hard truths, because I'm coming for a church without spot or wrinkle. I'm coming for a church without stained garments. So as I... As I tell you these things, because I have the absolute right as the risen Savior, the King of King and Lord of Lords, but my grace, my this is grace. Amen. This is amen, DeAndre. This is God's grace. The letters are God's grace. So he's saying, I have in my sovereignty, I yes. I preach. Every, I told you guys everything I told you. But in my sovereignty, I'm te I'm sending another letter. I'm sending another letter because grace is different. So I'm sending another letter. This is their last opportunity to repent before I start unleashing the judgments. These letters come right before the judgment. I don't know how long of a time span, but we know the letters went out and then the judgments. And then the wrath. Man. So these are. When God. When Jesus sent the letters out to the seven churches. That was grace. What was in the letters was also correction. But it was grace nonetheless. Because Jesus made it plain and simple. Repent. If you have an ear. Hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. You better hear and hear it clear. Repent. Repent. And then he continues. So. Now we are at. Verse eight. Revelation three and eight. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. Jesus is saying to the church of Philadelphia, and this is going to hit some of us. You don't even have as much as the others. Mm. Limited resources, increased persecution. You still honor and proclaim the name of the Lord. The open door is access to authority and power. He leaves that access open to those who are faithful. Hallelujah. This, see, this is, I love how Jesus, oh, I love when Jesus speaks. Because he already told us, I'm giving, he said to Philadelphia, I'm the one who has the key of David. The key of David represents power and authority because God is sovereign. He can do what he wants and his grace can be shown on who he wants. So some people may say that's not fair. Why is Philadelphia walking in so much authority and power? They don't even raise as much money. They don't even have as much stuff to give out. Why are they walking with so much power? Who they think they are? How they doing all these things? We raised five million dollars. They only raised a hundred. We got fifty thousand members. They got a hundred. Who Philadelphia? That ain't fair, God. We do way more. If you look at it, we got all this. Jesus is saying, even with the little you have, 
in the, the high persecution, you still honor me and you proclaim the name of the Lord, meaning for him to bring up persecution and they still proclaim. That means I'm in Cali and um, Victorville. That means that. They're proclaiming the name of the Lord. They're thank you. Thank you. They're proclaiming the name of the Lord despite the persecution. But the minute they tell us we won't be able to this, that or the other, we, we stop in our tracks and we don't we no longer know how to proclaim the word of the Lord. We no longer know how to walk in faithfulness. We we then start uh, cheating and skimming and scamming because it's getting hard. It's going to get hard, saints. But what did Jesus say in verse seven? He has the key. And he set before us an open door that no man can shut. So Jesus opened the door for us to walk in power and authority. And nobody can shut that. Nobody can stop that. I don't care what you're facing. You have to stay faithful. You have to stay faithful to walk in that access. Hallelujah. That open door is access to Christ's authority and power. I don't want to walk in my own power. I don't want to walk in my own strength. I want to walk in the power and the authority of the enemy because his power is the only power that is able to defeat the enemy. In our own strength, in our own power, the enemy will defeat us. We were never meant to walk in our own strength and our own power. This is a spiritual war. But in Christ, we are more, way more than what the enemy could ever. He's no match to those who are faithful and walk according to the word of God. Let's go to verse 10. I mean, nine, I'm sorry. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So when he's talking about, and I'm surprised I didn't write this. When he's talking about the synagogue of Satan, he's talking about those who are worshiping because there was a, a, um, and I am so surprised. I don't have this in my notes in Philadelphia. There was a synagogue where they did all of the idol worship. Um, and so he's saying that even those who willingly serve a false God will also know they will also know um, that I have loved thee. So those who proclaim to be Christians, those who, because it says, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. So these are those who are professing to be Christians, but they are really with the enemy. They are really servants of Satan. They are re really doing Satan's bidding. He said, even I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. So when you're getting persecuted, when you're getting talked about, when you are getting mistreated for standing on righteousness and holiness, God said, even those among you who pretend. So you have some who, and this, this be hard. Now this one, our flesh be trying to point out stuff. You'll have those who are professing to be Christians, but do everything sinful and are ahead. Because of their sinful practices. So they may lie. They may cheat. They may, you know, falsify information. They do all these things and we see them actively thriving while we're standing up for righteousness, being talked about, looked at funny, persecuted, and not having enough 
as for what it seems in a natural eye, in a natural sense. It's like we don't have enough. There's not enough. And we see those who we know by their fruit are not living in a righteous or not living a, um, according to righteous standards. We see that with their fruit. We see that. And it seems like they're thriving all around us. They're getting everything. Everything is just going so well for them. They have it all. And we're sitting here standing on righteousness. We're standing on righteousness and suffering. What did Jesus just say? I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And what is the prerequisite for this type of sovereign grace? Remain faithful. Do what God has told you to do. Walk in holiness and righteousness. And what seems like everybody is surpassing you and getting ahead, they will worship at your feet. Not worship you as you, as you are God. But they will come to acknowledge your God in your face because he going to show up and show them who he is in your life. But we got to remain faithful and we're going to see a lot of this happening. We're going to see a lot of this happening as as we further along, as we go further along in this life, we're going to see more persecution. We're going to see more things happening because we are living in the time of revelation. So as we as we as we continue to live, just keep living as we continue to live, we will start to see things that that don't align to what we're believing. But God is saying, remain faithful. I know resources are tight. I know the persecution is high, but remain faithful and watch what I do. Remain faithful and watch what I do. Amen. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So let's break this down. If you keep the word of his patience, patience is steadfastness, constancy, endurance. Not uh, not swerve from your deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and pity, piety by even the greatest things and trials and sufferings. Stay faithful even in great trials and suffering. Listen, <laughs> when we think of patience, this is not what what. In American um, English translation, that's not what comes to my mind when I think of patience. But that's why it's important to read the original, in this case, Greek. Because if you keep the word of his patience, it's not just like be patient. No, it's saying steadfastness, deliberate purpose, loyalty and, and, and faith and piety. By even the greatest trials and state and suffering. Stay faithful. That's what patience means in the context of this scripture. I will keep. So if we break down, I will keep. So Christ is saying, if you keep the word of this patient, if you stand strong, even in suffering, even in trials, you remain faithful. I will keep. Who is I? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus will keep. What does keep mean? Attend to carefully. Take care of. To guard. Metaphorically, it means to keep one in the state in which he is. 
What is Jesus saying? This is why it's important to study the word so we can truly understand what Jesus is saying to his people. If you remain faithful, you have access to power and authority through Christ. And you don't give up. You, you stay loyal to who he is and what he says. He will take care of you. He will keep you, attend to you carefully from the hour, which is the time or season of temptation. What is temptation? Trials of the condition of things or mental state where we are enticed to sin or to lapse from the faith and holiness, adversity, affliction. Trouble. If we remain faithful and loyal to Christ, he will open a door in his sovereign grace that nobody can shut that will keep us from the season or time of trials. Which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I never teach on, I never teach on, oh, pre-trip, post-trip. I never teach on that because that is not important to salvation. What's important to salvation is keeping your eyes on Jesus. He didn't say anything about when it's more of in this time. Remain faithful because remember, he done sent the letters out to all the churches. Now he's encouraging Philadelphia for their faithfulness. So that means they're going to experience even more persecution because he's issuing another warning to them. He's encouraging them, but at the same time, warning them, stay faithful, stay faithful, stay faithful. I don't care how hard it gets. Stay faithful. I don't care what it looks like. Keep trusting me. I don't care what the doctors say. I have the keys. I have the keys. Jesus is saying, I have the key of David, which is power and authority. And because he's God, he can do with it as he wished. This is how powerful that power and authority is. It can command death to leave. Literally and physically. He has the power, something that has been assigned to each and every one of us. Now, and if Christ comes before, we'll, you know what I'm saying? We'll meet with him. But he is saying, I have the authority to command death to leave, even though it's a sign to each of us. Power to raise the dead. So Christ has all power and all authority, and he lives within us. Why are we giving our situations, our circumstance? the enemy power to dictate and say anything in our life. This is a more, so this is a smaller scale of what we're taking from Revelation because Revelation is about the end time. We'll never get it twisted. We have to stay faithful in the end to endure. But in some of your lives, you need to apply this to your right now. To your right now. Because Jesus, power and authority covers everything. So why are you giving the enemy power and authority to dictate what happens in your life? Why aren't you giving that power and authority to the word of God? Why aren't we declaring God's word in these very difficult situations and these situations that seem bleak, that seem like there's no hope? Why are we declaring what the doctor say, the enemy says, the situation says? Why aren't we speaking the word of God in that situation? 
because he has all power and authority. He has the key. So why are we allowing the enemy to dictate what we do? Just like in the last days, are we going to buckle when it gets hard? Are we going to break and bend and start compromising? No, that's why Jesus told Philadelphia, you guys have the least amount of stuff, least amount of resources. Don't you buckle and bend. I don't care what they're doing around you. Stay faithful because I have the key. Hallelujah. Stay faithful. Faithfulness is important, you guys. We must remain faithful. Hallelujah. So then the next part of the scripture, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. If you are on this earth, you will witness the hour of temptation. It's going to come upon all that dwell on this earth. God says he will keep the door of authority, which is access to him and his power open to all his faithful servants. He will shield us from the power of the times. He will shield us, his faithful, from the power of the times. So he's going to keep that access to his power and authority open to his faithful servants. I want to be counted amongst the faithful. Hallelujah. Verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Jesus will come quickly. Hold on to your crown, which is the eternal blessedness, which will be given to genuine stewards. In this hour or time of temptation, don't lose the promises of God to the faithful by following sin. What causes you? To lose your crown, which is your eternal blessedness, sin. Don't start following after the ways of this world. When stuff starts getting hard and difficult, do not follow the ways of this world. If they saying, hey, just do this, you won't have to worry. If it's sin, don't do it. It will be easier. It will probably even be beneficial. But is it worth your soul? I'm telling you, as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ, because we're closer and closer, every day that goes by, we're closer to his return. There will be opportunities to come up. There will be opportunities to get things easy. Christ is saying, I'm so, I'm, he's so on his way back, y'all. Don't get caught up in sin when he already said he had, you have access to power and authority. He will keep you. He will cover you. He will protect you. He will guide you and lead you. Don't get caught up. Don't get caught up. Verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God and I will write upon him my new name. That is three and 12, Revelation three and 12. All that overcome will be a pillar, which is to make firm, establish, be a part of in the temple. I will write upon him the name of my God. What is he saying? All will know that you are of God and belong to him. Verse 13. 
with God is our resting place forever in his temple. The city, New Jerusalem, is where we will be with God. So Christ is saying, all those who overcome, he will establish you to his God. We will be with God the Father. All of us who overcometh the hour of temptation, the time, the season of temptation, he will establish you as a part of the kingdom of God. And we will dwell where God is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We will be perfect, no longer subjected to sin and falling. We will be unmovable. Pillars are typically unmovable. So he's saying he will establish us. We will now be a part of the kingdom. No more subjected to sin and the temptations of this world. As long as we overcome till the end, we shall be established in the family of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We got to overcome. We got to overcome the hour, the time, the season of temptation. We have to remain faithful in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, and I said, I told myself, I'm going to start doing an hour each time. So that means we will start at number 14 and this leaves time for prayer. Hallelujah. So next week, we will be at verse 14, 3 and 14, and we'll finish all of that. Um, make sure y'all have your Bibles and your notepads. I love taking notes. I do them in different colors because we want to continue on. So what is God saying? At, I don't know. If you go through and watch the other videos on YouTube, you will see this letter, this, what he's writing to Philadelphia right now. He's encouraging them to remain faithful. Don't get caught up like they sister churches. The other churches, they were getting caught up. He's saying, remain faithful, remain faithful, remain faithful. Don't get caught up. Don't get weary and well doing. I don't care what you see going around. I don't see, I don't care what it looks like around you. I don't care what the world is offering. Remain faithful. And if you overcome, I will establish you and present you before my father. Hallelujah. So Lord God, in this time of Bible study, I pray God right now that you help your children to remain faithful. Help us to stand on your word firm. No matter what is going on around us, our faith, our confidence, and our trust is in you, dear Jesus. We thank you, God, that in every situation, we know that you are there. You give us power and authority. In the name of Jesus, power and authority. So we thank you, Lord, as we walk up right before you, as we seek your face, as we remain faithful to you. You will keep that, that door open that no man has the power to shut. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you right now for each and every brother and sister in Christ, God. Anyone struggling, Lord, I pray, God, that you just reveal yourself to them. Reveal yourself to my brothers and sisters in Christ who may be struggling, who may be going through, who may be feeling defeated and discouraged. Reveal yourself to them in the mighty name of Jesus. Help them to stand firm on your word. Help them to stand firm on your word, knowing that it'll work together for their good as long as they remain faithful unto you, as long as they trust you, as long as they commit to doing things your way. You said that door of power and authority, those keys to that door remain open in the lives of your children. So God, we completely and humbly submit ourselves unto you. We completely and we humbly submit ourselves unto you. 
in the name of Jesus, remove any and everything that is displeasing, any and everything that creates a barrier to you working out in our lives. We ask you to remove it now. We surrender all, God. We surrender all, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. God bless each and every one of you. Um, join me Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time from 5 to 6. We will do, uh, we will be on verse 1 of Galatians. Chapter 1, I'm sorry. Chapter 1. Depending how deep it get, we may only get to verse 1. Um, this is how I study the Bible. So just for some Bible study tips before we dip. Um, always try to have a Bible, a journal for one. And at least black ink and then some other colored ink and a highlighter if you can. Because you want to be able to write the Greek or um, Hebrew transliteration and definition, then you want to be able to rewrite it or, you know, break it down into a, a clear understanding or applicable way in your life. And this is to write it, you know, regular. And then this is to highlight any key points that you want to be able to come back to. Have you a study journal? I say stick to one chapter at a time. Um, Sometimes it's imperative to understand stuff like when we're reading Daniel, I'm, I'm doing Daniel with my daughter because she's also a dreamer. When we're doing Daniel, it's important to know that Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was prophesying about the children of Israel, you guys do know that 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 prophecy first came forth through Hezekiah. And the reason that Jesus said that they would be taken captive is because of Hezekiah's arrogance and pride after God allowed him to live additional 15 years. Hezekiah was trying to link up with the enemy, trying to get in good graces, strike a deal, like, hey, if I got your back, you got mine, which was not what God had planned for him. And as a result, uh, Samuel said, so Samuel said, you shall surely die. Get your affairs in order. Hezekiah cried out to God. That's what the Lord told Samuel. Hezekiah cried out to God. One thing that he did was, which was very um, important is it says he turned to the wall. And we know repentance is to turn to turn away from. So I truly believe that when Hezekiah turned towards the wall, he had to turn from to turn to the wall. That was a, a sign of repentance. But he wept hard and vigorously repenting and asking God for more time. And before Samuel could leave the temple, remember the temple was huge. Where where um, Hezekiah was, that wasn't no like from your front door to the kitchen. It, the temple was huge. So before he could leave, God said, go back and tell Hezekiah, I heard your cries and I'm gonna extend your life 15 years. Do you think Hezekiah just started to walk in righteousness and holiness? No. Hezekiah said, I got 15 more years. Oh, let me go ahead and so I ain't got to worry about no enemies. Let me try to make friends with the enemies. Start bragging, showing them all his goods and showing them everything. And Samuel, the Lord said, go back and tell him because it is. Now you are the children of Israel going to be taken captive. But you know what Hezekiah did? He said, can I at least, can there still be peace the rest of my life? So he, uh, 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 what's his name? Samuel issued that judgment and Hezekiah said, well, can I at least have peace my last 15 years? And God granted it. There was peace the rest of Hezekiah's life. But guess what? Those 15 extra years, he had Manasseh, the worst king. I believe it was Manasseh, the worst king. The worst king Israel had ever seen was birthed in those extra 15 years. Hezekiah didn't experience any of it. He died before the prophecy came to pass. Guess what else? Samuel wasn't alive 
when the prophecy came to pass. Was it Samuel? Not Samuel, my bad, Isaiah. Isaiah wasn't alive when the prophecy came to pass. Guess who was the next prophet that still had to proclaim the same prophecy from a few kings ago? Jeremiah. That's why it's important to uh, really study the word so you know where this started. It started with big old Hezzy. Hezzy did it. <laughs> so when Jeremiah stepped on the scene, God telling him, oh, I ain't forgot. One, they were still living buck wild and crazy. And guess who was a part of that prophecy? And guess who was a part of that uh, that captivity? Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. Yep. They were birthed, they were born into something they had no idea. But guess what? They still had to remain faithful. They worked for government. They still had to remain faithful. They didn't get to bow down to Darius and do all those worships and stuff. Mm -mm. And you know why? You know why that man hated them so much? Because they had power and authority. They remained faithful. And even in captivity, they walked in power and authority. David could interpret any dream. Any dream. Without even being told power and authority that no man could shut. His co-workers were magicians, wizards, sorcery, sorcerers. But he had all power and authority. They had some power and authority through divination, through demons. But Daniel had all power and authority. He was the fulfillment of the prophecy. And he also speaks so much of Christ. Mm. Y'all, the Bible good. The Bible good is something in there for ev everything you go through. It's something in there that can that the Lord can use to minister to you. So the Bible is so good. So I'm just doing Daniel with my daughter. But G Galatians, isn't it so good, um, God's girl? But Galatians, y'all, Galatians going to be good. Because you know Paul, that's Paul. Paul ain't no joke. Galatians going to be good. Okay. So I will see you guys on Friday. We will be in Galatians chapter one. I suggest you get your uh, journal for Galatians and get a journal for Revelation because you're going to need to, you're going to want to go back to this stuff. Look at your notes. You're going to see that the Holy Spirit will show you something over and over again in the scripture that you didn't see. Oh, amen, amen. So Friday, you guys, we will be there. Hey, if y'all want to be a blessing to me, please go into my um into my ministry that God is building. Please go into my uh bio. I published a book in 2013. And I really want, I want to, it's an ebook only. It's super inexpensive. It's Christian fiction, but it's good. I wrote and published, self-published a book. Um, I do want to get hard copies. Um, I'm also working on, you know, I'm writing out a print. I'm writing out the prayers that I do. Amen, anointed testimony. Uh, praise God for you. I'm writing out the prayers that I do, and I'm going to turn that into a prayer book. So, you know, I just did the one on depression yesterday. Um, I need to put that in my whatever you call that thing on TikTok, where it's like you had a little boxes or whatever, and it's set up, whatever it's called. Um, but if you want to be a blessing, please go in my bio. Yes. Um, yes. I, I'm still in the process of writing that because God said I got to have 30 prayers, y'all, and I only got like nine. So I got to keep going. He told me 30 and then I get to, um, I'm going I'm to have my mom type it up for me and then I'm going to submit it so I can self-publish it. But please buy my Christian fiction book. The link is in my bio. It's called A Love Like No Other. It is a great read for single Christians and married Christians. It's a great Christian fiction, um, but it's good and it's, it's really good. Okay, you guys. So Please go purchase my book. That will help me because I want to make that one hard copy. 
And that will help me when it comes to me writing my prayer book. I really enjoy doing ministry. I really enjoy, you know, sharing and expounding on God's word. It's so alive. It is alive in us. And God is so good. He is so faithful. Um, Keep trusting him. Keep depending on him. No matter what it looks like, you declare his word. You declare his word in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'll see you guys on Friday. You have a beautiful rest of the day.